Today we will learn and reflect on the military culture of Sparta, focusing on Plutarch's life of Lycurgus, the Spartan lawgiver and prototypical Spartan. Like Plutarch, we will also draw on how the ancient Greek historians describe Sparta and her warrior ethos, including Herodotus, Thucydides, and Xenophon. All ancient cultures are warrior culture, as depicted in Homer's classic, The Iliad. Although all Greek city-states were defended by citizen hoplite forces, Sparta was unique in that her army was a permanent army, where all male citizens lived in military barracks from the age of seven until they were 30 years old, constantly honing their military skills. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in our PowerPoint script posted to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. We have few paintings of Sparta because Sparta was quite well a uh, Spartan. Thucydides was quite right when he observed. Suppose the city of Sparta were deserted and nothing was left but the temples in the ground plan. Distant ages would be very unwilling to believe that the power of the Lacedaemonians was at all equal to their fame. Their city is not built continuously and has no splendid temples or other buildings. It rather resembles a group of villages and would therefore make a poor showing. Sparta was a city-state that dominated the Peloponnese, and that's the region that is separated by Athens and the rest of Greece by the narrow Isthmus of Corinth, and without that Isthmus, it'd be an island to itself. Sparta was a traditional and conservative agricultural society that was not welcoming to foreigners other than aristocratic guest friends. And there's three levels of Laconian society, with population guesstimates about 50 years before the Peloponnesian Wars are, the Dorians of the Spartan citizen class, about 30,000, including men, women, and children who lived apart from the Helots and Periochi in the villages in the Eurotas Valley. And we have the Periochi, 120,000, or about four times as numerous, and these are freedmen living in the many villages surrounding Sparta. And the Helot slaves are about over 200,000, or about seven times as numerous. These were the equivalent of medieval serfs who worked for the Spartan citizens on various land holdings. They lived mainly in Messenia, and that's the west coast of the Peloponnese. These guesstimates are from Will Durant's book, copyrighted in 1939. Professor Kenneth Harrell of the Teaching Company, now Wondrium, argues that the commonly accepted ratios may be a little overdrawn, and with current scholarship, he suggests that the free and slave populations were about equal, and he's lumping the Spartan citizens with the Periochi free citizens. But these will never be more than guesstimates. Even today, the southern portion of the Peloponnese is mostly countryside, and this is a picture of the Eurotas Valley in Greece today, which flowed past the five villages that comprise the Spartan city-state. Well, Durant says this, the Dorians lived mostly in Sparta on the produce of fields owned by them in the country and tilled for them by Helots. The freemen, or Periochi, lived in a hundred villages in the mountains or on the outskirts of Laconia, or engaged in trade or industry in the towns, subject to taxation and military service, but having no share in the government and no right of intermarriage with the ruling class of the Spartans. And the lowest and most numerous of all were the Helots, the captured non-Dorian population, or slaves captured in war. And Wilderan continues, The Helot had all the liberties of a medieval serf. He could marry as he pleased, work the land in his own way, and live in a village with his neighbors, undisturbed by the absentee owner of his plot, so long as he remitted regularly to the owner the rental fixed by the government. He was bound to the soil, but neither he nor the land could be sold. In some cases, he was a domestic servant in the town. He was expected to attend to his master in war and when called upon to fight for the state. And if he fought well, he might receive his freedom. His economic condition was not normally worse than that of the village peasantry in the rest of Greece. He had the consolation of his own dwelling, varied work, and the quiet friendliness of trees and fields. Yeah, you can tell the Englishman in Will Durant here but he was continually subject to martial law and to secret supervision by a secret police, by whom he might at any moment be killed without cause or trial. Now, Professor Kenneth Harrell states that the Spartan system of a Helot class may not be unique to Sparta. Many other Greek city-states had a hinterland where a subject population of slaves helped grow crops to feed the populace. 
and he points out that there is some fluidity between these three classes. Perioki could be promoted to citizenship for extraordinary service or demoted to HELOT status if they were troublesome. Another teaching company professor, Jeremy McInerney, discusses how the changes wrought by the Mycenaean Wars fought in the centuries prior to the Peloponnesian Wars changed Sparta from an open society, thriving with learning and poets, into a closed militaristic society that was only focused on warfare, ignoring learning and philosophy. The ancestors of the Helots in Messenia were the legendary kings of Agamemnon fame. Many of these kings fought so nobly in the Trojan Wars. These Messenian Wars, where the Spartans subjected the Helot population to a slavery of serfdom, were bitter wars fought over several decades. And our major source for the history of these wars is Pausanias. He was a second century Roman who wrote a travelogue of the Greek sites. Now this is a much shorter account than our other histories, and we have a link for his travelogue. And the countryside in Messenia was so remote that in the first phase of the Peloponnesian Wars, the Athenian general Demosthenes was able to land on the peninsula at Pylos undetected and spent several weeks building fortifications, although this was only about 50 miles from Sparta. And the continuing deadlock of the war and the fact that the warmongering leaders on both sides were slain in battle led to the peace of Nicias. And another factor was the Spartan desire to bring home the Spartan prisoners of war captured during the unsuccessful Spartan siege of Pylos. During the late 20th century, many historians tried to interpret the Peloponnesian War through the lens of the Cold War, equating Sparta with Russia and Athens with America, which meant that the wrong side lost the war. This analogy is also impaired by the fact that Sparta fought the war with the slogan, Free the Greeks, or Free the Athenian Allies from the Tyranny of the Athenian Empire. Like the British Empire, there was some exploitation of the Allies by the Athenians, although many Allied states benefited from the increased trade. And there were real differences between the two. Athens encouraged her allies to establish radical democracies, whereas Sparta encouraged her allies to establish oligarchies. But there's more similarities in the differences. All Greek cultures were warrior cultures, and all Greek city-states had assemblies where citizens voted on state policy and all Greeks shared the same gods and the same Greek culture, and they even called for truces for all states to compete in the Pan-Hellenic Games. Now, ancient historians had a different perspective. They admired the Spartan constitution and traditions, and the ancients placed a value on orderly society and governance by good law, expressed as eunomia in Greek. They saw the wild and erratic Athenian democracy as dangerous. After all, didn't the Athenians lose the Peloponnesian War after ousting their most successful general and even executing close to a dozen generals after they won a major battle? And didn't the Athenian assembly after the war hastily condemn their beloved Socrates to death? Now we'll discuss Plutarch's life of Lycurgus. And there's no unbiased accounts of Spartan society from Spartan writers. Their culture didn't promote philosophy and learning. When examining Spartan politics and culture, the primary source is Plutarch's life of Lycurgus. Although he lived 450 years later, he consults Herodotus, Thucydides, and Xenophon, and he also draws on many other sources that have been lost to modern historians. Was there an actual Lycurgus who was the original lawgiver of Sparta bringing order to a society that was torn apart by violence? Plutarch repeats the legend that his very own father, King of Sparta, was struck down by a meat cleaver when he tried to break up a fight. Whereas the lawgivers of Athens, first Draco of Draconian fame, and then Solon, likely were actual persons, we are far less sure of Lycurgus, who very well may be the mythic depiction of the ideal Spartan. One origin myth of Lycurgus demonstrated his innate virtue after he ascended to the throne of Sparta when both his father and his older brother passed away. When the widow of his elder brother discovered she was pregnant, she let Lycurgus know that she was willing to kill the infant and marry him to provide an heir. Maybe she thought that her life was in danger because she had a possible usurper to the throne in her womb. But Lycurgus only pretended to go along, but soon after the infant was born, he held him up in the air and announced, Spartiates, a king has been born to you. And Plutarch recounts, all the people were delighted and were impressed by his high-mindedness and justice. And legend has it that Lycurgus had reigned as king for eight months, and to allay suspicions, he decided to travel to various lands, like Solon did. And Plutarch recounts that he discovered the poems of Homer while traveling in Ionia, which he brought back to further the education of the Greeks. 
Now, we read in Plutarch that Draco and Solon, the lawgivers of Athens, were selected by consensus by the Athenians to draft the law codes of Athens. That was like Hergus selected. Plutarch says he formed a group of conspirators and 30 leaders advanced at dawn under arms into the city square to terrify and intimidate his opponents, which sounds like an unlikely beginning of a rule that supported constitutional reforms. Plutarch states that among Lycurgus's many reforms, the first and most important was the institution of the elders, who were, as Plato says, a source of security and restraint since they tempered the feverish rule of the kings and the political system had previously been unstable, sometimes dominated by the kings as a tyranny, other times dominated by a democracy of the masses. And this council of 30 elders, which included the two kings as elders, restored the ship of state to an even keel, sometimes siding with the kings to resist democracy, other times supporting the will of the people to resist tyranny. And Will Durant says that the powers of the kings were limited. They performed sacrifices of the state religion head of the judiciary, whatever that means, and commanded the army in war. Now the Spartans were known for being laconic, saying little. They were known for their pithy communications. When they planned to block the Persian army at the Pass of Thermopylae in the Greco-Persian Wars, the Spartans were warned that the Persian army was so numerous that their arrows could block out the sun. To which the Spartan Dionekes responded, if the Persian arrows hide the sun, we will have our battle in the shade. In the Peloponnesian Wars, after a Spartan fleet was badly defeated by Alcibiades, an intercepted letter to the Spartan assembly simply stated, Ships lost, Mindarus dead, men starving, don't know what to do. And Mindarus, of course, was the Spartan general. So the Spartans quickly sent supplies and reinforcements. Likewise, the Spartan assembly was not like the unruly and raucous Athenian assembly, where heated speeches filled up the proceedings. In the Spartan assembly, Plutarch tells us that in Lycurgus' system, which was a mixed constitution, part democracy, part aristocracy, and part monarchy, as Sparta was the only state that retained her kings from the Bronze Age, no one was allowed to express an opinion except the elders and the kings. But the people did have the authority to decide about the measures proposed by the elders and the kings. All male citizens were admitted to the assembly when they turned 30, and the day-to-day -day government decisions were overseen by five ephors elected from the citizen body, that also supervised the training of the young and the public moral and religious life. And Sparta suffered from the same social pressures as did Athens in many Greek city-states. That was the widening chasm between the rich and the poor, which caused many Greek city-states to erupt into civil war. Plutarch states that the most revolutionary of Lycurgus' constitutional reforms was the redistribution of the land. There was terrible inequality, Crowds of paupers without property and without any means of support were accumulating in the city, and wealth was entirely concentrated in the hands of a few people. And this is pure Plutarch. He's ever the moralizing historian. In order to banish arrogance, envy, crime, luxury, and those most chronic serious political afflictions, wealth and poverty, Lycurgus persuaded them to pool all the land and then redistribute it all over again so that everyone would live on equal terms and with the same amount of property to provide an income in barley and fruit. Later in life, Lycurgus commented that the whole of Laconia looked like an estate which had recently been divided between a large number of brothers. And of course, historians differ on these details as well. Was there an actual redistribution? Who knows? Lycurgus tried to pull up and divide the furniture, but that was too drastic for the Spartans. So he attacked greed by political means. Lycurgus revoked all gold and silver coinage, and iron was the only legal tender. Then he assigned to the iron such a low value that 10 minus his worth needed a large storeroom in one's house and a team of cattle to transport the wealth. Once this decree was enforced, many types of crime disappeared and lasted upon. So the money was too heavy and bulky to steal and carry. Was this really true? Well, perhaps that was a legend that Plutarch repeats. Now, Will Durant said this was done to prevent the landowning aristocracy to be displaced by the mercantile classes, as was happening in the rest of Greece. But Will Durant observes, Human greed remained, however, and found an outlet in official corruptions. Senators, ephors, envoys, generals, and kings were alike purchasable at prices befitting their dignity. And Plutarch tells us, Lycurgus then set about ridding the state of useless, superfluous professions, forbidding their citizens to engage in industry or trade. And again, pure Plutarch. 
Once luxury was deprived of the things that enliven it and nourish it, wealth gradually wasted away of its own accord, and there was no advantage in owning a great deal of property because wealth had no means of displaying itself in public, but had to stay shut up in idleness at home. And it looks like Plutarch is describing what's really a utopia. Was this utopia the reality in Sparta? Well, who knows? Now, what is true that without a thriving economy, foreigners did not seek to live in Sparta. They preferred to live in Athens. Athens was far more welcoming to workers from other city-states. As a result of this slow immigration and her low birth rate, Sparta's population never matched its influence in the Peloponnesian Wars. Sparta never recovered demographically from the earthquake early in the wars that wiped out an entire class of young Spartan soldiers. Yeah, you know, perhaps the earthquake collapsed her barracks. Now, during the Greco-Persian War, Demardus, who was a ex-Spartan king that fled to be an advisor to King Xerxes, he said that poverty is Greece's inheritance from of old, but valor she won for herself by wisdom and the strength of the law. By her valor, Greece now keeps both poverty and despotism at bay. Now, after the Peloponnesian War, some Spartans did indeed have silver and gold coins. The Spartan general Gallippus was caught skimming out of the sacks of coins of war tribute. And in response, the Spartans declared that all the silver and gold should be sent away as mere alien mischiefs. The most fundamental reform credited to Lycurgus was the militarization of the Spartan state. Now, the Spartan state resembles a story I've heard of a remote airbase and army outpost in the boondock right in the Vietnamese War. So you ask somebody at the airbase what they were there for. They said, well, we're here to protect the army outpost. Well, you ask the soldiers, what are they there for? Well, the army was there to protect the airbase. Now, in the case of Sparta, once she conquered and captured a Helot population far larger than her own, she chose to institute a military state where all male citizens were full-time soldiers in part to prevent the Helots from rebelling. Was there any other reasons for this military training? Now we had an in-depth discussion of the hoplite infantry warfare in our video on Herodotus and the Greco-Persian Wars. To sum it up, the Greek hoplites fought in strict formation with overlapping shields, and the line could not break. For if the line broke, the enemy would pursue and slaughter you. Now, I've not seen any mentions of this in the sources, but since hoplite warfare requires such an orderly formation, and you can only learn how to do that with constant drill, the Athenians must have had some kind of refresher reservist training like the monthly drills or our National Guardsmen participate in. Although the Spartan reputation for excellent hoplite infantry soldiers was legendary, the Athenian hoplites were their equals in battle. Now, in the first battles of the Greco-Persian Wars, the Battle of Marathon, the Athenian and Plataean hoplites alone defeated the mighty Persian army under King Darius. Why? Well, the Spartans were busy with a religious festival. They couldn't get there in time. The Spartans were embarrassed that they reached the battlefield after the battle was won by the Athenians. So, when the son of Darius, King Xerxes, returned many years later with a much larger Persian army for revenge, it was the few thousand Spartan hoplites that held off the much larger hundred thousand Persian army at the Pass of Thermopylae. They held off the Persians for many, many days until they were defeated when the Persians were shown a mountain trail that bypassed the Bottleneck Pass. And this remarkable battle was melodramatically retold in the movie 300. During the Greco-Persian Wars, the Spartan advisor Demartus said this to King Xerxes, The Spartans, fighting singly, are as good as any, but fighting together, they are the best soldiers in the world. They are free, yes, but not entirely free, for they have a master. And that master is law, which they fear much more than your subjects fear you. Whatever this master commands, they do. And his command never varies. His command is to never retreat in battle, however great the odds, but always to remain in formation and to conquer or die. Now the Persian spies saw the Spartans at the Pass of Thermopylae relaxing, stripped for exercise, and combing their hair. When they told this to King Xerxes, he was bewildered. Herodotus tells us that Xerxes called his Spartan advisor Demartus, the exiled Spartan king, for an explanation. These Spartans have come to fight us for possession of the pass, and for that struggle they are preparing. It is the custom of the Spartans to pay careful attention to their hair when they are about to risk their lives. And Plutarch also speaks about the hair. When men of Sparta come to age of 20, they let their hair grow long, and they look after it, especially in times of danger, making sure they kept it sleek and well combed because they remembered something like Hergus had said, that long hair increases the attractiveness of handsome men and the fearsomeness of ugly men. 
Now we'll talk about the military training of Spartan boys, which began at age seven. They no longer lived at home. They lived in barracks and various herds, as Plutarch tells us. So they became used to playing and learning together under the same rules and regimen. The boy who showed the greatest intelligence and fighting spirit was put in charge of the herd. And the rest kept their eyes on him, listened to his orders, and endured his punishments, so that their education was a training in obedience. Plutarch continues, The boys learned to read and write as much as they would need to get by. While all the rest of their education encouraged ready obedience, the capacity to endure hard work, and the ability to win in battle. This is why, as they grew older, their training was stepped up. Their hair was cut short, and they became accustomed to go about barefoot and played naked. And Plutarch continues, At the age 12, they stopped wearing tunics and were given one cloak a year, which they wore both winter and summer. They slept along with others from their unit or herd on straw mattresses they packed themselves. They're under the command of an iron, which is a 21-year-old recently graduated from his boyhood military regiment. Plutarch says this young commander tells the sturdy boys to fetch wood and the smaller ones to fetch vegetables, and they go and get them by stealing. Some go to people's gardens, while others, with cunning and caution, sneak into the men's messes. Any boy who is caught is giving a thorough thrashing for being such a careless and incompetent thief. They also steal any food they can, so as to learn the art of getting past sleeping people in careless guards. A boy goes hungry as well as being beaten if he is caught, because their meals are never generous, so they learn to rely on themselves to ward off hunger by their own bravery and cunning. Pseudo-Xenophon elaborates, and we say Pseudo-Xenophon because this work credited to Xenophon is likely not Xenophon, according to most scholars. Anyway, he says, Clearly, a prospective thief must keep awake at night and by day practice deception and lie in wait, as well as have spies ready if he's going to seize anything. Clearly, it was like Hergus's wish that by training the boys in all these ways, he would make them more resourceful at feeding themselves and become better fighters. And we'll talk about the Spartan military way of life. Once the boys graduated from their military training of 20, they continued to dine in the common mess hall until they were 30, another institution that was credited to Lycurgus. Men commonly married during this time, they would sneak out in the middle of the night for a tryst with their wives. Pseudo-Xenophon tells us that it was a matter of disgrace that a man should be seen either when going into his wife's room or when leaving it. Intimacy under such strange circumstances meant that their desire for one another was bound to be increased, and any children born would be much sturdier than if they exhausted each other. I guess this is according to the science of Sparta. And likely this odd arrangement hurt the birth rate of the Spartans, as many men likely chose to stay in the barracks to catch some sleep before the next day's rigorous military training exercises. And the common meals were typically Spartan. Their famous black soup was boiled pork and blood, flavored only with salt and vinegar. Plutarch says when Alcibiades fled to exile in Sparta, he lived the life of a Spartan citizen. He exercised, lived frugally, and wore a frown on his face. And he wore his hair in need of a close cut, bathing in cold water, eating coarse bread, and supping broth. And Plutarch, who admired the Spartans, said that the common messes stopped the Spartans from spending time at home reclining at table on expensive couches, fattening themselves up like insatiable animals, ruining themselves morally as well as physically by indulging their every whim and gorging themselves until they needed long sleeps, hot baths, and a great deal of quiet and daily nursing. And we can tell that Plutarch was known as a Stoic philosopher by these comments. Now, Plutarch says what well, is definitely true that these messes were a great equalizer, for when rich and poor ate the same meal, the rich could not even use or enjoy, let alone gaze upon or display, all the paraphernalia that their wealth acquired. Thus, Sparta was the only city in the world where wealth could be seen as truly blind. All those Spartan men were permitted to live with their wives and families after they turned 30, at which time their boys were probably too old to be at home. They were probably in training themselves. Often the men continued to take their meals at the common mess hall. They never left the military way of life. The Spartan men were soldiers all their lives. Plutarch tells us that the system set up by Lycurgus did not allow them to be involved in manual work at all. There was not the slightest need for them to engage in business because wealth was no longer something to be admired and respected. The Helots worked the land for them and paid them in tribute. They did not have to work. This constant military training also made the Spartan officer corps skilled at military training, 
During the Peloponnesian War, the Spartans excelled at improving the military standard of motivated allies. For example, in the doomed Sicilian expedition, which led to the eventual downfall of Athens, the Athenians transported thousands of hoplites to Sicily. Sparta sent only a small contingent of hoplites, but the Spartan general Gylippus drilled the Syracusan forces to the highest Spartan standard. And together, the small Spartan contingent and the larger contingent of hoplites defeated the Athenian forces. Plutarch says that the reform of the common messes angered the rich of Sparta. He recounts a story demonstrating the moral character of Lycurgus and how Lycurgus reacted when the young man Alcander attacked him with a stick bloodying his face, and even poking out his eye. Lycurgus reacted like a pure stoic. As punishment, Alcander was handed over to Lycurgus, who dismissed his usual servants and attendants and told Alcander to attend to him. Because Alcander was a man of honor, he carried out his orders in silence. As he lived with Lycurgus and shared his life, he came to observe his self-possession and high-mindedness, his ascetic lifestyle, and his inexhaustible capacity for hard work, and became extremely attached to him. He used to tell his friends and acquaintances that Lycurgus was not dour or surly, but was uniquely gentle and even tempered with others. So this was Alcander's punishment, and the penalty he had to undergo was to change from being an insubordinate, badly behaved young man to a very well-mannered and responsible adult. As can be imagined, the Spartan lifestyle encouraged homosexual relationships usually between older men and teens and preteens, and they were both prevalent and condoned, although there is the admonition by the moralizing Plutarch that older men sought to improve the character of their younger partners. Pseudo-Xenophon expresses his reservations about this common Greek practice of pederasty, or men-boy love, as did the real Xenophon in his Symposium Dialogue. If out of admiration for a boy's personality, a man of the right character should himself seek to befriend the boy in all innocence and keep his company, Lycurgus would approve of that and consider it the finest training. If on the other hand, someone was obviously chasing after a boy for his body, he regarded that as an absolute disgrace and laid it down that at Sparta, lovers should refrain from molesting boys just as much as parents avoid physical intimacy between their children or brothers and sisters. It does not surprise me, however, that some people do not believe this, since in many Greek cities the laws did not oppose lusting after boys. One of the most bizarre of the Spartan practices was their cryptea, or secret police. Plutarch tells us that the young commanders would send the most intelligent of their teen soldiers into the countryside with nothing more than a dagger each and a bare minimum of supplies. By day, the young men spread out and find remote spots where they could hide and rest. But at night they came down the roads and murdered any helots they caught. They used to walk through the fields and kill the helots who were in the best shape and condition. Does this make sense? We read in Herodotus how part of the Spartan forces fighting the Persians included many helots who were promised their freedom, and they fought valiantly. Supposedly they were not cowed by their continual brutal treatment. Plutarch speculates that perhaps this was not an institution established by the virtuous Lycurgus that perhaps had developed after the Helot uprisings after the severe earthquake that killed so many Spartan warriors in the early years of the Peloponnesian Wars. The Spartans were often cruelly harsh to the Helots, mistreating, intimidating, and shaming them. Plutarch tells us that the Spartans used to force the Helots to drink large quantities of undiluted wine and then bring them in the common messes to show the young men what it was like to be drunk so they wouldn't be shamed. They also got the helots to make fools of themselves by performing degrading songs and dances, while denying them the right to perform any which were suited to free men. But Thucydides does tell us of an actual incident in the Peloponnesian Wars, when the Spartans were unsure if the helots would revolt when the Athenians had held the fortress at Pylos. The Spartan general, Brasidas, proclaimed that the helots should choose those among them who had fought the best on the battlefield for Sparta, implying they would be given their freedom. Now this was only a test to find the helots who showed the most spirit, who came forward first to claim their freedom would be the ones most likely to turn against Sparta. Two thousand helots were selected, who put garlands on their head and went round the temples under the impression that they would be made free men. And then these two thousand helots were slaughtered by the Spartans. Now modern historians are held hostage by their ancient sources. We cannot tell what life was actually like in the ancient times. Practices vary from decade to decade in any society. 
we can only say what the sources tell us and argue over the reliability of the ancient accounts and how they are confirmed by inscriptions, coins, archaeology, and other sources. And in conclusion, as Plutarch tells us, as a result of Lycurgus' reforms, his fellow citizens lost both the will and the ability to live as individuals. Instead, they became accustomed, bee-like, to always being organic parts of the life of the community, to swarm around their leader in a state of near ecstasy induced by their eager desire for recognition, for all this was a military culture, and to commit themselves wholly to their country. Well, Durant states that health was one of the cardinal virtues in Sparta, and sickness was a crime. Fat men were a rarity in Lacedaemon. There was no law regulating the size of the stomach, but if a man's belly swelled indecently, he might be publicly reproved by the government or banished from Laconia. And there was little of the drinking and revelry that flourished in Athens. Sparta had many admirers, including Plato and Plutarch and Xenophon, but as Will Durant quips, they could afford to praise Sparta since they did not have to live there. They did not feel at close range the selfishness and coldness and cruelty of the Spartan character. They could not see from the select gentlemen whom they met or the heroes whom they commemorated from afar that the Spartan code produced good soldiers and nothing more, that it made vigor of body a graceless brutality because it killed nearly all capacity for things of the mind. And we will also have a related video on Spartan women and family life and the sayings of Spartan women later in 2022. And now let us discuss the sources we used for this video. Since all our videos in the Peloponnesian Wars use many of the same sources, we have a video on book reviews of ancient Greek history. Our primary ancient sources are the history of the Greco-Persian Wars by Herodotus, and the histories of the Peloponnesian Wars by Thucydides and Xenophon, and also the lives of noble Greeks by Plutarch. In addition, we picked up this penguin collection of writings, Plutarch on Sparta, and it includes several lives of Spartan generals that we previously found only in the Dryden translation, which we do not like at all, since it's so poorly phrased and difficult to read. So maybe with this translation we'll also do another video on Plutarch's noble lives of the Spartan generals. It also includes an amusing collection of Spartan sayings and Spartan women sayings and a short essay on Sparta by the author I am calling Pseudo Xenophon because most scholars do not believe he's the true Xenophon, although he appears to be copying his style. And after reading it, this makes sense to me, although I did not read the original Greek. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.